Okay, good morning, or good afternoon, is it? Still good morning. Um, as I was introduced, my name's Gary Barnes, uh, and I work in the food and agribusiness team at the Australian Trade Commission, otherwise known as Austrade. Uh, my topic today is Australia's agricultural competitiveness from the customer's perspective. I should be moving through here, here we go. Okay, I'm going to start with our definition of customers. At Austrade, we use customers to mean overseas buyers and investors. Uh, the Australian business, businesses and organisations we work with are called our clients. That's because Australia is fundamentally a network of people working for Australian businesses and our people are embedded in their markets and have ongoing relationships with their local business communities and governments. That makes us unique, I guess, in terms of Australian government department where we have most of our people based offshore, not here on Australia, in Australia. You can see there... We have some 85 locations, I think, in 45 different countries, and that's growing. So. Our job is to help businesses understand and access overseas markets and business networks. We don't have much right here to tell a horticultural producer or a meat processor how to do their job, but we can help them find the right market or the right customers overseas. And today I'd like to share what we see through that network from our work in overseas markets uh, and what we think means for both Australian uh, agricultural and food exporters and also for the future of trade development work that we do. At the global level, demographic change, income growth and ongoing urbanisation are driving major long-term trends that can potentially benefit Australian agriculture. Research centres like ABARES have done important work looking at the impact of population growth, the rise of the Asian Pacific middle class and the resulting shifts in food consumption out to 2050, particularly in key markets like China and India. The shift in the balance of the world's economic activity to Asia and the Middle East over the coming decades is another story, although Already China and the Middle East are already our two principal agricultural export markets at $4 billion apiece. This will change the geography as well as the composition of trade flows. And as we are starting to think about what the new Silk Road might look like, um, but that story is only just starting to unfold. Technological change is another key driver all along the supply chain. It's reshaping every step from production through to distribution and finally creating a new global set of consumers with access to far more information about what they buy. And this has a big flow and effect on how products are marketed. How we manage our environment and critical resources such as arable land, water and energy is something we do well and also an area that is ever greater priority for our trading partners. And finally, we, while it is important it's often a two steps forward and one step back. The new free trade agreements with key trading partners like Japan, Korea and China, uh, with the prospects of more to come, as has been discussed uh, this morning, uh, are great news for the food and agribusiness sector. So what does all this mean for Australia's competitiveness from the point of the, uh, from the view of our customers or our overseas um, customers? All across the Asian markets, we're seeing a broad shift underway from the old short-term price-driven trading markets to ones that is much more built around integrated supply chains, uh, long-term supply relationships and differentiation between different suppliers and different countries of origin. This is good news as it plays to Australia's strengths and provides us some defence against external factors such as the movement in the Australian dollar. But it also means that we have to look again at how we do our business. Some players in the market are already meeting this challenge, but others may need to adapt their business model uh, to stay relevant and competitive. This shift I'm talking about is encapsulated in these two images here. Historically, Australian agriculture developed in a big sunny country, shipping minimally transformed commodities like wheat and wool to more or less guaranteed markets in established Northern Hemisphere economies like Britain. <clears throat> We've long been a trading nation, but in reality our producers haven't always had a strong connection to their ultimate customers. Consolidators and intermediaries have shipped our products between markets according to the best prices, and even periodically withdrawn them from export entirely. 
our investment in building our brands overseas, with a few exceptions, uh, such as for red meat, has been minimal. <laughs> our adaption of production of products to local tastes has been inconsistent and slow, or this is, and this is what our customers are telling us. Even today, we have $100 million export industries with marketing budgets measured in the tens of thousands of dollars, and this leaves us exposed to new competition. So this is a challenge to the way that we have traditionally done business, to not only focus our efficiency and the quality of our production systems, but to truly understand our markets and find a differentiated role within them. To maintain our cost competitiveness, but build our ability to be price makers rather than price takers. And if that weren't enough of a challenge, we have to bear in mind that Australia currently produces enough food to feed only around 60 million people, or about two and a half times our population. The markets in our immediate region currently have about 500 million middle class consumers and that number is set to multiply several times in the coming decade. We can't talk of success in terms of market share. That will decline because our markets are going to grow so large. Success will be about staying relevant and having a compelling offering for the targeted segments of the markets which provide high returns. And we need to do this in a way which also balances the risks of spreading ourselves too thin with those of over committing to one customer or one large market. China's size and diversity of potential warrant special focus and development of strategic strategy and the signing of the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement means that many of our products will be more competitive than ever before. But the growth of demand in China and its resource will have a knock-on effect that creates new opportunities and challenges of their own. So with all that context in mind, our question is how do we make the most of all these opportunities and challenges for Australia? Alongside reducing the cost of production, how do we increase our revenues and minimise the risks around our access to our overseas customers? The first big global trend that Austrade sees as being important in the coming years uh, is the enormous growth in the middle class population segment. Nearly all of it is in the Asia-Pacific region and the opportunities and challenges it brings right now and in years to come. Okay, discretionary food. If we look at Asia as a region, the number of middle class consumers is forecast to grow from 500 million today to 3.2 billion by 2050. That translates to an annual increase of 75 million additional middle class mouths, which is about twice our current total agricultural exports each year. Economists tell us that two things happen when people enter the middle class. They spend more of their new higher income on food and they shift from the kinds of foods they buy from plant-based staple foods towards higher quality, higher value foods, particularly animal foods like meat and dairy products. And that certainly matches all that we've been seeing, with plenty of stories in the media about our milk fetching $9 a litre. Perhaps Charlie can comment on that later. Um, and, and, and other beef and uh, beef export uh, records hitting, hitting new high records. And less obvious trends like the success of our feed grains into China to support their domestic um, protein production. The forecasts are that even with big increases in their domestic production, China and other countries are going to be importing a lot more food, particularly high protein products. All of these signals tell us that we will have plenty of customers if we remain relevant and competitive. But right now there are no guarantees that we will if we just sit back and assume that customers will come and seek us out. So now is the time for some careful planning around this. Okay, the opportunity for Australia, as we see it, is to become an enduring preferred source of food among this emerging class of consumers. This has the potential to drive our exports of horticulture, seafood, premium meat, wine and other consumer-facing food products and to flow on to high-quality ingredients like staples in, the, in bakery products and oils. In this differentiated market, premium doesn't mean luxury goods. It means excellence at every price point. Uh, or a quality that's worth paying for. 
So what are the challenges in that? Firstly, we need to, need to meet the standards of the new middle class consumer. For example, around product innovation, availability and tailoring. These globally connected customers know what they want and if we aren't producing it, they will, they'll have plenty of other places to look for it. Next, we need to back up our, our, what we're selling with a much clearer story for Australian food that makes the emotional link back to what our overseas customers already know about Australia. That is our beautiful natural environment, the expertise and integrity of our agricultural systems, the aspirational aspects of our lifestyle, uh, and all ties of our diversity of products and markets into one big positive picture. This is how we achieve the premium positioning that allows us to command the prices that will make us profitable in the long run. This represents quite a large shift from the present situation. When Austrade talks to customers overseas, the big retailers, importers and distributors, they describe Australian foods as being under-promoted, not tailored to local tastes, packaged too cheaply for the price point, not consistently available, too slow to innovate or follow consumer trends. Uh, the way the brand of Australian food is presented is also described by key customers as inconsistent and confusing or simply absent from the market. I mentioned earlier that we're seeing a rise of the online channel for food exporters into China. This is really an interesting opportunity for a lot of Australian businesses because it offers a simple, lower cost way to enter the China market. Importantly for today, today's discussion here, uh, the appeal to the consumers uh, that use it is in part because it offers a more direct, trusted channel to the products uh, that they know and trust, and fresh and processed foods are among the most popular. So what does it look like? Just to give you an idea, over 300 million consumers, now I know there's a lot of um, figures being bandied around this morning, but if you just stop and contemplate some of these numbers, they're quite staggering. Over 300 million consumers and a 50% annual revenue rate, growth rate reaching $500 billion in 2014. So that's 50% growth last year in online sales alone in China to reach a total of $500 billion of business done online by 300 million buyers. That online channel covers business to business wholesaling, <coughs> online shopping centers, local versions of Amazon and eBay, uh, and everything in between. So we need to engage with that channel because our customers are already there and they are buying. We also know that the sector is highly fragmented. Our diversity of products and produce is a great asset in one sense, but in practical terms it means that we operate as numerous small players spread across many markets, which dissipates the impact of our already small presence in an increasingly competitive international marketplace. Our marketing and promotional efforts have also been fragmented across categories and regions, meaning that Australia lacks a consistent, coherent voice for the sector and puts us at a disadvantage against countries like New Zealand, which has been discussed uh, this morning, who are several years ahead of us in creating a very clear national umbrella brand for what they produce. Strong, focused, consistent marketing and promotion that builds the sort of momentum we need is extremely challenging to do so, uh, where we are spread too thinly. As a small player in global terms, having a unified voice and a compelling story that appeals to our customers is one of the simplest and most effective things Australia can do to maximise our impact in overseas markets. Okay, research carried out by Austrade last year has confirmed that Australian food and beverages are known as clean, green and safe. That's another term that's been used this morning. But we don't own that territory. The same research also showed that Australia's overall image is not, in fact, strongly differentiated. There are many different countries and suppliers that can make similar claims, and we are definitely not the only exporting country going after these emerging marketing opportunities. Our role in Asian food markets is going to be at risk if we position ourselves simply as selling good quality food, or even clean, safe food. Ultimately, competitors will emerge whose food is clean enough, safe enough, high quality enough, but at a lower price. So what happens to us then? 
without a compelling story to tell about what makes Australian products worth paying more for, told consistently across categories and regions, we're going to be very vulnerable. Despite all these challenges, this is a time of huge opportunity for Australia and we have an enviable set of strengths to play with. There are only a few countries in the world that have the potential to become one of the truly aspirational choices for consumers in Asia as a source of their food. And Australia is one of them. We're already succeeding with our meat, horticultural products, seafood and grains, achieving premium prices. But there are tens of billions of dollars of value to be unlocked there if we can get it right across the bigger picture. <coughs> the second big global trend we see around is basic food security. Now, this is not driven by consumers uh, directly, but instead by governments and large trading and processing firms. Food security is an area where failure is completely unacceptable and it's a non-option. As a matter of a government policy, many of our trading for many of our trading partners, feeding the population is quite simply a fundamental need. And it is quite separate from the rising middle class consumer demand uh, because that trend is about the highest income demographics that will take our direct food exports. But this second trend is about the other 90%. Food security is about global food demand driven primarily by population growth. Total world population is predicted to pass 8 billion by 2030 and 9 billion by 2050. Linked to that, food demand is predicted to increase 50% by 2030 and 70% uh, respectively by 2050. In 1960, each global hectare supported two, just under 2.5 two people. Uh, in 2005, it was 4.5 people. In 2050, it's estimated that will grow to six and a half people. Land and water are clearly going to be increasingly precious assets in coming years, and the challenge will be to increase productivity in a sustainable way. Australia has a critical role supplying bulk grains, commodity meats and animal feeds to satisfy these staple food requirements. These are the largest part of our agricultural exports by volume and value, and always have been. Once again, However, we need to consider how we will stay relevant and competitive within Asian markets over the long term and in a much more price-driven arena. Here we are in large commodity markets. Our ability to raise prices is limited. We will keep working on cost, but what can we do to manage risk around our access to overseas markets? This graph here behind me um, is of the projected market share in Asia. The take-home lesson is that even with increased productivity, the enormous growth in demand means that our share of global markets is shrinking. And if we're not, not a minor player, we're certainly not dominant. So how can we better safeguard this trade, which remains our biggest source, dollar, dollar source of exports? At the moment, our positioning as a commercial agricultural commodity trader as part of the global distribution and marketing businesses actually works against the strategic interests of, our, of governments of our key markets. While they look to establish secure supply of staple foods, we offer limited security and the potential for our supply to shift to a different market as the market forces dictate. We see periodic closures of many markets, perhaps in part resisting this position of reliance. Uh, it's appropriate for our agricultural commodities to be sold through the market system, but we can also take a broader look at what we have to sell. It's not just products. We have, we have the opportunity to leverage the knowledge and the skills that we have developed over more than 200 years in some, of, in some cases, um, farming in some of the most challenging farming environments on earth. And we have an education and research sector that is internationally recognised. It may be a familiar, even everyday system to us, uh, but in the eyes of international customers, it's a real asset in its own right. There is an opportunity for the Australian food and agricultural sectors to bring together our product, services and research capabilities and position ourselves as long-term partner in food security across the region. Responding to strategic needs of our trading partners and building on the depth and breadth of our production skills. We can make the offer to the Indias and the Chinas and the Indonesias of this world. Uh, that not only can our exporters supply you with bulk agricultural commodities to meet your needs right now, 
but we can also work with you to improve our own agricultural production uh, because we have the best practice systems, services, skills and high quality inputs. We can also offer opportunities to invest production in Australia and be part of new integrated food supply chains. Even quite modest, in, modest initiatives uh, to build the production capabilities and environmental sustainability of our trade partners can have great impact uh, with the industries that would otherwise lobby against our access uh, and the adoption of Australian systems and standards uh, that further underpins our reputation for quality in our own food exports. At Beef Australia recently, interest from visiting delegations, mainly from China again, um, but nevertheless, uh, in areas such as herd improvement and genetics was the strongest that we've ever seen. So we think the food security needs of our trading partners represents a significant strategic opportunity for Australia. It turns our diverse production systems and our comparatively small scale into an advantage. Because of the scale of demand, even for premium foods, um, far dwarfs our production cap capacities. Uh, we aren't doing ourselves out of a market. In fact, we're strengthening our position as a source of excellence in helping promote alignment of our systems and processes with those of our trading partners. <coughs> For Austrade, doing this successfully means committing to supporting our agricultural services sector alongside our traditional product exporters. As part of a, low, a longer tr term trade development efforts, we want to help them scale up, build export revenues and help them reinvest in the next generation of innovative IP in Australia. It also means supporting investment into Australian agriculture, whether that be domestic, and I think as I said before, domestic investment is quite limited, so we have, our only option is to look internationally for that. And I guess that comes into um, the government's recent announcement of the North, Northern Australia policy as well, has a lot of this backed around investment in terms of setting up um, uh, integrated supply chains. So if we get this right, we believe it will support our agricultural service businesses, um, but also that it can lower the long-term market access risks for the agricultural commodity exports that are so critical to the sector. So what are the opportunities and challenges? To sum up, the Australian agribusiness and food sector is going to have to address some big challenges if we want to be competitive in the eyes of our customers in this new globalised market environment. We don't know how much room there is for complacency about the need to change uh, how we do business as an agricultural exporting nation, but we do know that there are both great opportunities before us and, great, and a great risk that they will pass us by. The current and projected global demands trends mean that we can potentially grow our food and agribusiness exports <coughs> to several times their current annual value of, of 40 plus million dollars. But to do this, we will need to grow the value of our exports much more than the volume. The role of trade development is greater than it has ever been before for the sector. Uh, because of the critical role of our national reputation and positioning in the competitiveness of our products with overseas consumers and customers, for Austrade as a trade development agency, uh, our own ways of doing things need to evolve along with the industry uh, to take advantage of the long-term market trends and the immediate commercial opportunities that emerge. We think that capturing the opportunities will mean repositioning Australia from a medium scale commodity trader to being a regional leader in food security solutions and a preferred source of high quality food for the growing group of affluent consumers across our key markets. That's going to take a unified approach across the, uh, approach across the sector and investment into Australian agriculture and food will be needed to help us build up scale and be competitive. So to sum up, we think this is a huge opportunity for Australia. Uh, we are only one of a few countries in the world that have the potential, uh, we do, to become an aspirational choice for global food uh, consumers and a regional leader in food production expertise. There are billions of dollars of value to be unlocked uh, if we can get it right, and we have a lot, of, we have a lot more to, uh, to do and to talk about so we can make that happen. Um, but Austrade looks forward to supporting the sector uh, in developing this and finding those customers and capturing those opportunities. And I would like to finish there. Thank you.
you, Gary. We've got time for a couple of questions. No hard ones. No hard ones. <laughs> no questions from the floor? Okay. Oh, yes, we have. Tony. Gary, um, thanks for that presentation. Just a quick question um, on the matter of uh, food security and, 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 and the second element of what we were talking about. Um, what's the impact of um, other government response, you know, we're building the capabilities or the alignment with, with other countries in terms of their food security needs? What's your comments about the likes of Indonesia, you know, making an 80% reduction in the quota, the import quota of live cattle? Yeah, I, I, it's a difficult thing, it's obviously a very political uh, one, maybe some of my other colleagues here might be a better place to answer that. But um, I guess overall, as far as Australia is concerned, we only see those as a glitch. It's a short-term thing. Um, it will bounce back. I mean, it's evident that the amount and the rate in which um, food demand is growing, that they can only ever be looked at as a, as a short-term um, uh, glitch in the market. Now, as to the real reasons as to why they've cut that dramatically, who knows? Um, I certainly don't. I don't have a, a magic ball, uh, crystal ball either. Um, but certainly short term. Over and above that, I think the, the growing demand from in the next 10, 15 years is certainly going to outweigh any short term um, downturns in, uh, in markets like that. 